Hi, welcome to the Dice Cup in Nottingham. We're at the table. I'm Steve Rain. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Windle. And we're continuing my top 30 games of all time. If you haven't seen 30 to 21 or 20 to 11, have a look at previous week's videos. But this is my favourite 10. These are the best 10 games in the world ever of all time, according to Steve Rain. Oh goody, it's number 10. Uh, and number 10 is um, a Euro game uh, with very, very strong player powers, and that is The Voyages of Marco oh, Polo. I didn't put it on the list. Uh, so, oh, before we continue, these two boys have had two minutes to think of ten games that might be in my top ten, and we're going to see at the end how many they get right. Um, the Voyage of Marco Polo is a tight, a difficult to do well at Euro game, which I really like. The first time I played it, I just ran out of money, I did really awfully. The first time you played it, you did really awfully. The second time I played it, I thought, oh, I mastered this, I didn't do very well. Uh, and then every time I've played it since, I'm getting slightly better and slightly better until I get to the point where I think, yeah, this board set up with this player power, yeah, I know what I'm doing now. And I still get blocked out. People beat me to the spot I want, people put dice where, oh no, I know I can't afford to go there. Um, and it's just great. And what I really like about it is the player powers. The player powers are super duper powerful. You think, this power, yeah, I can do yeah, everything. And he's got one. Oh God, he's doing that so much better than me. And then she's got one over there. Think, oh my God, how can she do that every turn? I can't afford to do what she's doing, that sort of thing. And so the player powers in this game make this game. I still haven't played with every power. I still want to, and it is one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it was in my top 30, and it's a superb Euro. One of my favorites, easily. Um, and it is, as you say, it's one of those that keeps me coming back because of how difficult it is to do well. You mm. have to really, every time you come to it, think carefully about what you're doing and be aware of what everyone else is doing. Mm. It's one of those that really rewards replay, that you just enjoy it the more and more you play, I think. And they, obviously, they, so the, the powers are cool, excellent. They make the made game, it is my favorite like dice placement style game, just because Everything tracks so well that you're wanting everybody else's power, especially in particular situations. You go, I wish I had the power right now. And when you're sat in the middle of the board with one of your camels and you're like, oh, I could really do with that right now. Mm. Yeah, I love it. It's a fantastic game. Unbelievable. It's number nine. My number nine is a cooperative game. It's a cooperative mm. game with cards where you can't see what you've got, and that is Hanabi. And that Yes, yes, I got it. <laughs> yep. uh, and Hanabi is a game I just prefer to play with two people. I, do, I don't mind with three people as well, but the benefits in Hanabi uh, for me is I don't like playing with conventions, and I like kind of sitting with people, talking about people, saying, and using logical deductions to try and work out well, he didn't tell me about this last time, which means that this card missed me something I need to know about, but not so important that I can actually play it. And going down those routes, I've still yet to get all 25. I'd love to get 25 points at some point to the point, but I just love the effort. I love the thinking. I love the logical deduction in a game that isn't four hours long. It's like 20 minutes, 15 minutes long. Um, and you can just sit there and play game after game after game, getting better and better with whoever you decide to play it with. That's what I really like about it, is the fact that you can, because it's short, just keep playing it and mm -hmm. playing it and playing it, and you see yourself improve from game to game to game. That progression you go through, you know, with a heavy Euro, you can do the same thing, but it's going to take you weeks and weeks and weeks, because you can't play it more than once or twice a week at best. But you can play it multiple times a session, that's and right. you enjoy it each time. You probably enjoy it more each time as you get better. Yeah, that's right. Because you, yeah, you, say, you just see you as a group working together. The mechanics and the, the thought process between yeah. you work better, and that's the excitement for me in the game. Oh, yes. Oh gosh, it's number eight. Next on my list is a, uh, another heavy Euro game with some theme, um, and the board looks gorgeous. The board's got lots of gears on it, and that's Tolkien, the Mayan calendar. Yep, got it. Um, Didn't. I love Tolkien. Again, it's really, it's, I don't necessarily think it's very tight. Sometimes you think you're struggling to feed, sometimes you think you're struggling to do this, but you can say, fine, so what, my workers are gonna go hungry for 10, I'll lose some points because what I want to do instead is this. Um, and effectively, you can, you effectively, you're riding your luck, you're leaving on the work for longer and longer and longer, which means you get fewer actions, the actions you get are better. You know, put people down or take people off. But you're trying to do various things to collect points. You've got to think about your end game scoring right from the start, um, and I just love it. I don't, I think it is essential to play it with the expansion. I'm of the opinion that the 
not necessarily the tribes themselves, but the prophecies force people not to do the same thing every time. And I think it can get ruined yes. if someone kind of does that. I know how to win this game strategy, which I, I know what to do and I don't do it. I Some think. people struggle to turn off. They can only see the win yeah. and that's um, it. Especially Euro games, I hate to say, yeah. have that so, very... Sadly, this game dipped for me in terms of how I rated it. It dipped and now it's come back up because I've played it a lot recently with yourselves yep. um, where we've just played the game for what the game's meant to be, a nice, decent, heavy Euro game. And a really complex puzzle that you have to think about in a very different way yeah. to many others because you, I mean, obviously in games you're meant to look ahead, but you, you can physically see yourself looking ahead on that board and everything's about timing. Yeah, it is, it, you can almost see into the future. Yeah. Because you can see how the wheels are going to move. So on, this will be off, here. On, off, That's right. This will be here. <laughs> yeah. This will be here. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, it's great. Really good, yeah. Yeah, I do love it. It's great. I think it's another one by the game, same guy as Marco, the voice of Marco Parlo. Same design. Oh, really? oh, I didn't know that. He did Lorenzo Il Magnifico, so I think you will like that. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Crikey, it's number seven. So my number seven is my last social deduction game on here, and it's probably the one I've had the most fun doing. One Night Ultimate Will? It is One Night <laughs> Ultimate anything. I think the, the vampire one is great. I think the alien one will be great when I get it. And both werewolves <laughs> ones are great as well. Um, but I, I think it's just outstanding as a game. I think to have that social deduction part where you keep changing roles every 10 minutes, you have a five minute nighttime phase and a five minute discussion phase and people are lying throughout. They've done it, they've put the, you can pick the walls in such a way that people are lying even when they're on the good guy side because they know if they tell the truth straight away they're gonna get mm. caught out. They're gonna get the wheels, they're gonna wangle it around so they can do it. So you've yeah. gotta lie from the start and everyone's gotta be lying. And I think it's great. And it's one of those games where if you sit down with a group and it evolves and you say, all right guys, we're gonna take this roll out and put this roll in. And you think about what did he say last time? What did he say? Why is he always claiming to be drunk? He hasn't had a drink in ages. Um, and all these different things and I just think it's Brilliant. I think it's just a fantastic game and the app just makes it outstanding. The app is great. Mm. The length of the game is great. The fact that it packs all of that sort of what used to be a really long game if you ever played the original werewolf game um, into a very condensed time span and still retains all of the good things about the game. Yeah. I love it. I've had a great the time with it. Massive variation on roles and they add yeah. more and more and more but they don't... 50 odd now yeah. I think worse, they're just different and they add that all that variation. If you don't like a roll, don't play with yeah. it. There's no reason, there's there's no reason yeah. to make it a bad game for yourself. You can tailor the game to how you want it to be. And yeah. it's just a quick press on the app, literally. And you can play it with such a wide variety of people as well. Yeah. I've you've played it with kids, with You can change the family. difficulty level based on the roles, if you know yeah, what you're Yeah, that's right. You just, you, oh, you, you've never played before? Okay, so here's three villages. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then you, okay, we'll take one villager out, put this guy in, and you know, oh, it's just great. And so, it's number six. Okay, my number six is uh, another heavy Euro game. Uh, it is a game with uh, 12 races, and that is oh, Terra, 14, mis 14 Terra races. Mystica. That's Terra yeah. Mystica. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I love Terra Mystica. I haven't come anywhere near to solving it yet. I know it can be done, but I just love the challenge in it. It's not quite a sandbox, but it feels to me like I can do whatever I want within the context of the game. On my turn, I've got all these resources. What do I want to do with them? Do I want to go shipping and traveling and sailing? Do I want to build a bridge? Do I want to use this power to double dig? Do I want to build up to a temple? Do I want to build up to a stronghold? Do I want to use my race's special powers? And you've got all these different things you can do. Do I want to pass early so I get this bonus tile? It's just great. I think in terms of expanding, brilliant, but you've got to expand in the context of how to score points as well. So if you want to do well by scoring points, you need to look at how the points are laid out, what your race is good at, and kind of go down that way. You need to not get blocked in, but you need to be near other people to get power. I just, I just think there's just so much scope there. Um, that it's just unparalleled in terms of replayability and variability in the game. It's how all those different mechanisms are interconnected mm. that draws you in. It's engaging in a way that, for me, theme is the thing that usually engages me. I get lost in an adventure, whatever it is. But this one gets me lost, but in the interconnectedness mm. of all the mechanics. And it's very hard to think of another game that really does this, certainly as well as Terra Mystica does, because it's very hard to describe why it's so good. But when you play it, you're like, oh, this is this, and this connects with this, and oh my goodness, all these different things are connected. 
and you try and do something and hope it works out and the more you play it the more you see how the things connect and uh, it's superb. I think there's a lot of playing with the other players in the game. I don't, it's, it's not a solo game. Yep. The map partly, but the track, like the maze tracks, the competition on there, timing everything, getting as much of the magic booster to you at the time when you need it. Yeah. Uh, and then just balancing out, and all the other the race powers just make it yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. Marvelous. It's number five. My next one is a combination of two games because I decided that I had to pair them together based on the fact that I can't play either of them again. And that is Escape, uh, the Escape the Room games, Unlock and Exit. Yes. I, it took me a while to, I, every single game I've played, I have loved. And it took me a while to appreciate that until I played the very last Exit one that we had access to, that I didn't care that I couldn't play them again. I didn't care that I destroyed the games, I didn't care I'm going to have to wait six months. I had such a good experience playing these Escape the Room games with the group we managed to get playing these games. People who really liked it stayed in the group, people who didn't, didn't join in with us. So we just had a really good core of people playing these games. I think my favourite of the two is Exit, but my favourite actual Escape the Room game is The Island of the Dr. Gorse, which is the unlock one. And I don't know if that actually mirrors these two guys here in terms of The Island of Dr. Yeah. Gorse was fantastic, and it's actually the only one we didn't escape from. Um, <laughs> yes, it's yeah, true. so it's partly my fault. But anyway, but I actually like real life Escape the Room games, and these just do it so well. I've done seven real life Escape the Room games, I've done seven Escape the Room board games. Uh, and I just love that idea, I love the puzzles. I don't think I'll ever tire of them, and I think as soon as one comes out on the shelf, it will be my number one game that I would like to play. The only reason it's not number one on my list is probably because I just won't get the same number of plays from it. Then yeah, yeah no, I absolutely love them as well. And that's a really interesting observation, actually, that you're right, as soon as it comes out, you want to play it more than anything else. Mm. It jumps right to the top of your most it's, wanting to play it's list. It's the next episode of Game of Thrones to me. Yeah. Yes. Is I need to watch, <laughs> I need to do that before anyone spoils it. Before, and what more, more likely yeah. is going to happen, before my group, my excellent group that I love playing these escape movements, play it when I'm not there. Because <laughs> that's happened before with time stories. Um, so I, that's what I need to do. And I, when next time they come in the store, they are getting played that week. They are getting played that day. They're that good. Yeah. I haven't done any of the real life Escape the Room things actually, but I'd really like to. Mm. Um, but a part of that I think is just the cost. They tend to be very expensive, mm. don't they? Whereas these, despite the fact that you can only play it once, are actually great value for money. Each, isn't it? Yeah, so I highly recommend trying these if you've not tried them before. Well, I never. It's number four. My number four is a game I've spent the most time playing probably in the last six months or so. And that is Magic the Gathering. Oh! Yep. Got that. <laughs> I didn't put that one down. Um, so, again, yeah. a bit like... Magic the Gathering for me is not a board game, that game. But it's definitely a board game. It's a card game. It's a game where you are... It's a collectible card game where you are competing with your opponent, whether you're drafting, whether you're constructed, whether you're playing limited or anything like that, whether you're just playing for fun. I just love it. I didn't think I would appreciate it as much as I did. I learned to play the game because I had the cafe and people were talking to me about the game and I've been hooked ever since. I went to my first GP uh, we, not last week and the weekend before. I had a what's, great time. What's Grand a GP? Prix. Grand Prix? Yeah, Grand Prix of Magic. Which is a tournament? Yeah, there's like 2,000 okay. people playing the main event but I just sat there and played side events because I haven't been playing long enough to do well at a main event like that. And I just had a wonderful time. I love the game. I think it is so versatile, so ever-changing that Although it is, a, you know, obviously people will complain how expensive it can be to stay on top of that thing. And yeah, that's, that's an expense I'm happy to pay because I do enjoy that much. I played it quite a bit a few years ago, only casually. And for me, the one big criticism, which you might be able to address now, having played it a lot more than me, was that with some games, you just wouldn't draw enough land mm -hmm. to be able to get your cards out and you'd get whitewashed by your opponent. Yep. And in other games, you'd draw far too much land and you couldn't get, you didn't have enough creatures to get out, and you get whitewashed by your opponent. It just felt too swingy in terms of the land draw. It felt like it needed some way of balancing out the amount of land you got, so that at least you could get going and get a chance to compete. I guess it depends on how you construct your deck. If you're playing a constructed one where you can pre-construct your deck, if you get card draw in your deck, 
So if you get like cards that you've creatures that you can play that can draw your cards and stuff like that. Okay. You can cycle through your deck or you can you can play a spell to, to discard two and draw two. So if you've got a handful of land you can do that. And so if you certain decks will, okay. will mitigate that more than others. And it depends how you do it. And effectively you, you design your deck to do one thing very well. Um, and as long as you get the kind of the initial starting land, yeah. your deck will do what it's meant to do unless you Maybe that's better then, because I don't remember any of those cards particularly from playing it, because it was a good number of years ago that I played it. Yeah, I mean, it happens though. Even the best players will, you can beat the best players because they can get stuck on land twice, okay. or flooded with land twice, mm -hmm. and that's fine, and that's how it should be. It's a bit like poker. Poker's yes. a great game, yeah, unless okay. you never get aces. <laughs> you know, I mean, unless you never get good hands. Oh, I never get good hands. But in the long run, it balances and then out. The three times I got good hands, they all folded. I mean, it's just, it's just um, in the long run, you, if you are better than your opponent, you've got better deck than you all win. Okay. All right. Uh, but yeah, Magic, I have spent a lot of time doing it, and I, I will continue to do so. Extraordinary. It's number three. So my number three is my third and final Stefan Feld game on the list. Would you like to hazard a guess? Oracle at Delphi. Yeah. It's the Oracle at Delphi. Um, yeah. In terms of Stefan Feld being about mitigating dice rolls and getting bonus actions, no game he does does it better than the Oracle at Delphi. The amount of bonus things you can do, the fact that you're trying to complete 12 tasks, but sometimes you can complete five or even six of those tasks in one go when you only get three actions. You think that's impossible. But kind of chaining together things, chaining, you know, so that you're, when you roll the dice, you're giving yourself the best chance to use the different things you can get, um, the best you can do means you'll do the best. You can look at the board at the start and think, oh, that's the best way to go, but that's the only yellow cube that way. I need to go and get that yellow cube first. If I do that, I'm going to be ahead of everyone else. Yep. If I get this action, if I move these gods up and they roll the right things, my gods get into the top before theirs will allow me to do some things very well. And I, I just love it. It just seems to be that it's something I'm, I just can see the board and I can say, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And I just in, enjoy the puzzle of it before the start. You don't, not even on my turn, but before mm. the start kind of seeing this is, and the board is set out differently every time with the cubes in different places and the board's completely modular, loads and loads of different modules. Uh, it's just fantastic. I say it's a highly strategic game as opposed to tactical because you need to be planning constantly. Yeah. Because it's just the way it's going to work out. It's the only way to succeed. And if you mitigate the dice rolls by having yeah. those, those favour tokens before you roll the dice, yeah. I mean, you, they, you mm. can't get done in by di bad dice rolls. Some people sit there and they've used all their the favorite. favorite tokens, and then they'll roll oh, three reds. What am I going to do with three reds? And they have to waste a turn kind of fixing it as such. Um, and if you can pre do that, uh, like a lot of his games, you can mitigate rolling the rolls of the dice, you can change them to be your advantage, so you'll do better with it. I think it's quite deceptive because the first time you play it, essentially it's like a pick up and deliver game. And typically those don't involve a lot of strategy mm. and it is quite luck best. And you can feel like, oh, well, I guess he just had better dice rolls than me. But then when you play the game more and more and more, you start to realize just how much strategy there is in the game. And that's why it was so high on my list as well, because I, I want to play it more and more and more. And I kind of see more in the game the more I play it. What I really want to do is just beat Steve. I have <laughs> managed to beat Steve. But, so I keep trying to play it without him to try and improve. And then the next time I play him, this is going to be my game. <laughs> Micah beat me on the first game. Really? Yeah. Was that an early play for you? I was like my fourth player or something. Oh, chance. <laughs> she beat me in a tie, babe. Okay. Ah, spiffing. It's number two. Uh, so my number two, uh, these guys have almost certainly got this on their list, and this is my favourite Euro game of all time, Choo -choo. and that is Choo Choo, it's <laughs> Russian Railroad. Yeah. I think it might be my only worker placement game on the list. I think you're right. I, think I can't I'm... think of another one. I've got Marco dice placement. Polo's dice placement, yeah, it's not I, really the same. I don't think I've got another worker placement. Yeah, you're right. Um, so that's really weird because I, the worker placement games are great, but no worker placement game since I played Russian Railroad has come close to even challenging Russian railroads. A lot of these games I have, I like in the games because they've got super duper player powers or mechanically very sound, but no worker placement game has come close to challenging it. Russian railroads are just so tight. I actually prefer the base game. I think the German railroads gives you choice, but I just like maximizing my odds at the base game, I think. I, I just, I don't know what it is about it, but I don't like the increased choices necessarily. Yeah, okay. Um, it's less tight because there's more stuff involved while Russian Railroads is a very tight, yeah. very 
decision, the, the work spots that are there have been thought over, they've got exactly the right number, not one too many, not one too few. They've really, really worked hard to get the right. One of the really nice things about it is the fact that some spaces require more than one worker. So yes. instead of just putting one down, you might need to put two down or even three workers down on some spaces. And you have the same action on multiple spaces where the cost increases. Yeah. So obviously you, someone's going to go for the cheapest or the best one first but then it may well be worth you taking the more expensive one just in the situation you're at and trying to weigh up those, oh, am I better using three workers to get this? I do really need it, but it's three workers. Those decisions are great. Is it going to be there next time? Yeah, yeah. I love it, it's, it's brilliant. It just, it's great. And it's accumulating, score. The, the scoring accumulates as well. So you effectively, it's cumulative. So whatever you score in the first round, you score again, plus extras in the second round, and then all that again, plus extras in the third round. So you'll find that the last, the first round you might score five points, but the last ten you're scoring about 80 points, and you're just trying to pile it on and pile it on. So just eking out a few extra points on the first few rounds to add on to your score, so that when you're getting those 80 points, it's because you've got an extra five points there, an yeah. extra three points there, an extra two points there. Um, it's really good. I really like it. I, I think it's, if you like worker placement games, it's it's unparalleled. I think. I think you're right. Mm. By Jove, it's number one. Uh, so my number one is one that I haven't mentioned any of the lists so far because I generally don't treat it as a board game as such. I will never play it in the cafe, um, mainly because no one else really knows how to play the game. Um, but I've played it competitively, uh, locally, county level, international level as well, and that is Bridge. Uh, it is a game I've been playing since I was 14. Oh, actually I was taught when I was eight, I think. But I've been playing since I was 14 competitively at Bridge Clubs in competitions around the country since I was 17 and so on. And in terms of like linking it into all these other games I like, like Sleuth and uh, Ricochet Robots and Hanabi. Hanabi's the big one because I like playing Hanabi. I didn't want to spoil the surprise, but I like playing Hanabi with bridge players more than board gamers because in terms of the logical steps I like going through in my head. I don't play with conventions, I want bridge players to do it. And Bridge itself, if you haven't played it, it's the sad part the sad part is it's just really it takes a long time to get into the position where you can play competitively. Jonathan's, I've tried teaching you. I tried, yeah. Um, we played it for quite a long we time. Did. We did. We went to the bridge club. At one point, we came fourth out of eleven, which was on your like third, or, second or third time. Was pretty good actually, considering you're playing against people and playing for years and years. Um, it's the environment, and that's the problem. I think it's very difficult to learn bridge in a welcoming environment, let's say, because the bridge club is full of old people. Effectively, we were the youngest there by quite a long way. And you also, because of the format in which they play, and I can totally see why they play in that format, it makes sense in terms of wanting to get the most out of the game, but you keep moving tables, or you sit there and the people keep changing in front of you, so you're not playing with the same people throughout the evening, and you maybe get little bits of conversation in, but then they change and it's someone else, and you get a lot of kind of... Hi, nice to meet you. And oh, look, we're playing bridge. And then, <laughs> and then and, oh, bye, I'll see you later. <laughs> so I never really felt like I got to know anyone. I, playing it socially with the same group of four people, I think will be really satisfying week after week after week. And it is, I can see it's a really, really good game, but you need to invest a lot of time. But then I think you would be rewarded for that investment if you're willing to put the time in. I've gone to national competitions for 10 days straight, playing eight hours a day for 10 days. And I just, and so in terms of me generally not liking long games, I don't like long games where you get slow bits or people start drifting off. In Bridge, I'm concentrating right from the start till midnight. I just love it and nothing will, and I still haven't mastered it. It's not like I've solved the game. I get beaten still by people who've been playing, you know, just as long as me and stuff. So uh, it's just... It's so ultra competitive, and when I play bridge, I want to play at a high level. I generally don't like going to the normal bridge club. I want to play like national level. So obviously, that's guys. I've spent a lot of time in my life, kind of building up to that. So, uh, but yeah, it's just in the bridge is so far ahead of any other game on my list. Uh, okay. And that is my top 30 games of all time. You might notice a slight costume change here in the fact that um, my batteries of the camera ran out and we didn't have any spares. So this is a very uh, late um, ending to my video, but um, of my top 10 boys, how many did you get? I think I got six of them. I got seven. I was kicking myself because I didn't guess Voyages of Marco Polo and if well, I thought I about that, you, that would have been in your top Zolkin 10. Zolkin was the one who annoyed me because I knew you were going to put it, but... Just too quick, write it down to and just start thinking quick enough. And generally, so the other thing that surprised me was 
that you had the Oracle at Delphi higher than Bora Bora. I was expecting okay. Bora Bora to be higher. I was expecting Bora Bora to be in the top 10. Yeah, um, yeah so was I. After I don't that know, maybe, list, maybe it? it might be influenced, uh, yeah it was number 11, maybe it was influenced a bit with the fact that Oracle Delphi is a bit newer. Okay. Um, I mean, I prefer it. I do think it's a more enjoyable game, but I just surprised because Bora Bora is like the heavier Euro version, I suppose, isn't it? I I sometimes think that mm -hmm. I can be beaten. I can be surprisingly beaten at Oracle Delphi. I think I'm doing quite well, and someone goes and won. Okay. Um, and it's just got that slightly different ending to a Euro game than I'm used to. I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 It does it's feel very different. More different than any of his other games because it's a race and yeah, it yeah. feels different. I, I imagine in like five years' time, it will have fallen further, maybe because. It's it's quite new to me. It's my favourite game of last yeah. year. So, um, but yeah, I've played some yeah, possibly. But to some extent, that's the case. That's, yeah, yeah, definitely. You you want to play the game sometimes they're new because they're exciting. I'd be surprised if Feld managed to bring out a game that that I prefer to Oracle of Delphi. Okay. I can't see anything beating that, not from him at least. But I mean, I, I hope he does. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, that was like the pinnacle for me. Uh, any surprises generally? Uh, just that one. Because um, obviously a lot of the time I play games with you, most of the games I've played with you, apart from Magic and Bridge. Yes, there are a few sort of you had left field. Lot. When you had, you had, obviously you had quite expecting. a lot of party games, but I guess with work in the cafe, you've got to love party games to some extent, otherwise... I was surprised that you, yeah, you loved them as much as you did, to be a place on your list in the positions that they did. I wish, I wish we played more of them at the end of the night as well. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, so do I. It's hard to get the group together these days for some reason. People end up playing have Euros till 11 o'clock. Yeah. It does, it always strikes me as strange because I kind of imagine Steve as the heavy Euro gamer and yet he's also the party gamer. <laughs> like for me, Euros can get a little too heavy sometimes and party games can be too chaotic for me sometimes but Steve somehow, like they seem like opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah, it's just yeah. nice to relax at the end of the night. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to have fun. I think I intellectually I like my Euro games but just for having a laugh yeah, yeah, okay. Is it like you wind down after a nice stressful game? You need a bit something to slowly tick down and get it. Yeah, just played a four-hour game of Ark, right? Yeah, let's play one night on my werewolf. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, so um, if uh, if you like my list, uh, have, like the videos, we've seen Jonathan's, we've just seen mine. Uh, next time it'll be Mark's top 30. Um, I've been Steve Rain. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Windle. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.